Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Liquid Brain. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how AlphaFo is able to accomplish more than 90% of the GDP. What is their neural network structure and what kind of strategy are they using so that they're able to outcompete any other algorithm in the past and accomplish the 90% uh, GDP they are actually currently holding. So before I go in, I am not a machine learning uh, algorithm researcher or I'm a protein folding expert. So I'm trying to simplify a bit from what I understand and try to simplify it down enough so that most people were able to understand um, what I'm trying to say or what is it about and what are the significance around it. So first of all, some information about DeepMind. So DeepMind is actually a company that is specifically specialized on deep learning algorithm. So something they're very famous in is actually AlphaGo. So AlphaGo is actually a algorithm a few years back that beats the world champion in Go four out of five times, if I'm not wrong. And what, what is significant about it is that Go is one of the most complicated games to automate or, or try to build a strategy around because of sheer number of combination uh, in every single step. And every single step, there's an there's a exponential amount of combination and possibility, which is why in the past, nobody is able to build a supercomputer algorithm to be an Alpha, uh, a Go champion. But AlphaGo is one of the first companies that do that through deep learning. And AlphaStar, in the meantime, is the algorithm that actually plays uh, Dota 2 and StarCraft 2. And in certain situations where they're allowed to pick the map a little bit, they're actually able to beat the human players. And now we have AlphaFold. is the one, is the algorithm developed specifically for protein folding. Okay, so before that, what is CAS? So you heard about CAS 14. Obviously, this is the fourteen. This is the fourteen generation of the of the challenge they're running. Okay, so CAS is actually set up by Professor John Moore and Professor Christakoff Fidelis. I'm sorry for the name. Uh, in nineteen ninety four, and part of the way to you know research, want to progress, and test the establishment, test the establishment of the state of the art in protein structure prediction. So it's it can be either. You know, I, I don't know how, well, how else you do it beside computers, but yeah, actually, it, it's not specific to, let's say you have to use AI on this one. It's just a method for us to do so. And what the matrix that they use, the main test score that they use is something called global distance test. So it's basically what is the distance between the, the original protein versus the predicted protein and how far apart are they. So if it's a 50% means that 50% correct, on the amino acid location and 80% means that 80% of the amino acid are on the correct locations. Cross, cross, uh, there's a little bit more complicated um, calculation involved which you can actually go to see their website over here and there's a deeper explanation within that. And so what, they, what that boils down to is that how similar is the estimated structure versus the original structure and, and so on and so forth. Okay. So a little bit about protein folding and why is it so complicated. So similar to the previous uh, explanation in the game of Go, every single chain that you add into amino acids uh, increase the combination by an exponential way. So yeah, protein is actually just made out of a chain of amino acids. And every amino acid can be made out of 1 to 20. So there's 20 types of amino acids that humans use and there's more in other animals and virus and so on. And what they do is that after they link up in a chain, certain pair would actually pair with each other to, pour, to form a 3D shape. So similar when you take a bunch of strings and you crumble them together, they become a ball that is actually converting something like a 2D sequence into a 3D structure. And the interesting thing about the protein is that the shape actually determines their function. So if you are able to produce protein of a certain shape, most likely it will perform a certain function correctly. Okay, so the protein folding problem actually based on the, 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 the paper that I found has three things. First is the, sorry, this is actually from CAS. So what is the folding code? What is the folding mechanism? And the third one is, can we predict the navy structure of a protein from its amino acid sequence. So the third one is actually being deeply focused by DeepMind. Well, the first two is a little bit more complicated because uh, most of the deep learning algorithm is a black box and we don't really know 
how it folds, and we don't really know how it comes up with a certain solution. But now we are able to kind of know this is structure that we want, and so on. Okay, so the actual algorithm and actual you know array of how DeepMind have accomplished such a, such a high achievement or such a high GDP is not clear. They have not published the paper. They are in the middle of that, and this is uh, a basic picture that I pick it up from their blog post. So, and yeah, you can have a look at this picture. But let's go to the next one for the the, the paragraph above the picture for them to how they actually explain the algorithm. So, uh, so I'm just gonna invert him to, to read it out for you. And the important word are actually highlighted in in bold. Sorry, the important one are bolded in another line. So a folded protein can be taught as a spatial graph where residues are the nodes and edges connecting the residues in close proximity. The graph is important for understanding the physical interaction within proteins as well as their evolutionary history. For the latest version of AlphaFold used as Cas14, we created an attention-based neural network system trained end-to-end that attempt to interpret the structure of the graph while reasoning over implicit graph that is building. It uses evolutionary related sequences, multiple sequence alignment, and a representation of amino acid residue pair to refine this graph. First thing first, uh, what is the residue? So up here, I have a single um, template for amino acid where the R can be varied from a simple hydrogen to a methane, a methane functional group to many other functional groups. So there's 20 of them from big, small, hydrophilic, hydropedic, and so on. So most of the time, almost all of the time, the, the functional group, the residue, are the one that actually bonded with other amino acid residue to form that 3D structure. So imagine you have a you have a you have a string and they actually bond with each other on this side. The bondings are actually created by the residue pair and not on the amino acid chain itself, because the OH will be reacted with the other amine, but the amine will be reacted with another acid group. So there's no more additional chain there to be to be available for such bonding. Okay, so that is the first one. Okay, sec second one is spatial graph node and nodes and ages. Okay, so this is actually borrowed from an, another concept called graph mining, where you can actually imagine protein as a network of things. So in graph mining, you usually use for like internet crawling data analysis. Every website is considered a node while their connection to the other website is considered as an edge, so that, that arrow. So you can also you know, apply that model onto a molecule. So in this case, I'm using aspirin here because uh, it's much easier to, to comprehend rather than a protein chain. So you can see, you can imagine each of this uh, ball as an amino acid and how they're connected to each other. So the, the ball itself is a node, we call that a node, that is one amino acid, and every linkage we call an H. So that H is the linkage, the ball is the node. Okay, so that's what I that mean. And connected. So the second one is that they use an attention-based neural network system. So what is the attention-based neural network system? So it is basically is a, what we call a transformers. So if you don't already know, so transformers is a kind of a newer generation of attention-based learning algorithm. So the previous one will be the uh, LSTM and the other one will be GRU. So those two are what we have used in the past, especially important in national language processing. But now nowadays they realize that using a transformer network is actually accomplished a much higher uh, training speed as well as accuracy compared to LSTM and GRU. Of course, certain application, there are, there are different the different benefits and advantages of using certain network over the other. But what Alpha Fold is doing here is using transformers. And and I think previously they're using convolutional neural network. But this time transformer is the one and they're sticking to it. Okay, so the third one, okay, is actually attempts to train end to end. So this is used a lot in machine learning. What's the meaning of end to end is that it doesn't involve any human input into the algorithm. That means that they're taking the protein structure, protein sequence, and they just train on each other. There's no such thing like the human is going to clean up the data first, the human is going to say that uh, focus on the cytosine or focus on the guanine 
or not guanine, not cytosine, that's a DNA chain. But focus on the alanine, focus on the glycine, and then you know try to see if they are approximate and then do the prediction. No, that directly learn from the sequence to the to the structure itself without any human input. That's what meaning that's the meaning of N to N. Okay, and the third one, and they say that evolutionary related sequence, multiple sequence alignment, and a representation of amino acid residue pairs. So what that means actually is that they actually summarize it for us. Uh, they are actually optimizing for two things: the distance between the pair of amino acid and the angle between the chemical bond. This is the this is the what they call the uh, the the amino acid residue pairs wow for the evolutionary related sequence and uh, the evolutionary sequence and multiple sequence alignment is just that rather than just fit in the the protein sequence itself it also fit in the whole sequence alignment with the other proteins that is referenced to so i'm not exactly sure how they do it but how i would imagine is that if i'm running uh this protein is a uh, it's a uh, it's a what Cox egg, not Cox exam, not a good example. Uh, this protein is a is a antibody. So I'll also pair it with multiple different type of antibody, which I also have a structure on, so that machine can learn that how does the sequence differ from one alignment to another affect the final result of the of the structure. So they're able to learn from the difference between sequence and then the final three D structure of a certain part of the amino acid proteins. So and then they actually put in all the sequence alignment data as well as the, the outer sum data, which is the, the bond distance and angle data, and put it together with, a, with, a, with another algorithm that actually calculate which one, which parameter you use for which side. And then they generate a, a confidence score and as well as the protein model. And most likely they're not gonna just generate one single model, they're gonna generate maybe a few with a uh, different confidence level of how confident they're correct about this prediction. So I think this year they're doing something like ORF8 on coronavirus, which is a new thing. So we, they, don't, they cannot cheat and say, yeah, just, just find the online one and put it in. So it has to be trained from end to end and it has to be demonstrated that they're able to do that. Okay, so once I finish that, what, what now? So how, how would this affect the, the thing is it a B or an or and is this just are we can we stop researching on protein folding now definitely not so first of all there's a reason why they research on viral proteins because viral proteins and bacterial proteins are relatively simple they don't have something called the alternative splicing patterns so what that mean is that in eukaryotes such as animal cell or plant cell or fungus cell a, a single protein chain usually doesn't form a single proteins because they can be cut it up differently and joined differently. And the combination, sometimes we don't even know how it happens because a single amino acid chain, a single amino acid sequence actually can form five, six, seven, ten different kinds of protein structure. Depends on the way of how it is cut and how it is joined. So that might be the next one they want to tackle, which is try to use eukaryotes genes, eukaryote sequence to run and see if it actually works. Second is uh, chaperons. So chaperons are a protein folding assistant for a certain eukaryotes protein. Because uh, if you don't have a chaperons, protein will fold in a dynamic way and it will actually form it as, it as its most natural states. Uh, while chaperon actually serve kind of like a, what is that called? The, the assistant, whereby when you have a chaperon, the protein actually will fold into a different form and or different form or different shape, different structure all together because they're able to you know jump the, the the activation energy and form a new more stable stable states of the proteins. So it will also affect the folding. Uh, having chaperons and not having chaperons will have two different structural proteins. That's basically what you need to know. And the third one is could we reverse engineer protein sequence or you or use alternative protein, sorry not protein sequence, amino acid sequence. Can we reverse engineer the amino acid sequence or use alternative amino acid sequence to produce a certain compound? Such as if you only want um, one part of the antibody or you only want one part of the exam and you do not want it to perform. So you want an enzyme without activating activator uh, 
area so we can cut that out and only have the, the active side of the enzyme and cut everything out so there's much smaller you can produce in much higher quantity and with high, much higher efficiency that's one thing or you can use alternative protein sequence alternative amino acid sequence which is um, we don't want to produce a certain amino acid because maybe they're harder to produce or can we re-engineer a protein so that it's more compact and it's higher resistant to temperature, uh, heat, or, or some other pH level and so on. So that we can actually strengthen and a few bonds in between them so they can, they can behave in higher temperature. Uh, the the tech, next one I can think of is genetic testing and medication through artificial proteins, which is very similar to what I said just now. So instead of actually now we need to produce, let's say, a uh, certain compound cannot be produced uh, industrial in a very easy way um, because we, we can't, you know, there, there's no shortcut to the manufacturing process and the manufacturing process might be too expensive that we don't really want to produce them through like GMO and all that thing. And it's easier to kill an animal and get and extract the protein out of their blood. So maybe the horseshoe crab antibodies will be one of them. So we might be able to just produce those antibodies ourselves and obtain it at a much cheaper price. Same goes with, let's say, if I want to do a coronavirus detection kit. Uh, last time we have to use the actual coronavirus and do something to it. Now, if we have the viral amino acid chain code, would we be able to predict the, the antibody directly? Or are we able to just produce the antibody that blocks the viral, the viral protein directly without actually going through all the process of all this thing? So we can have a much easier uh, way of manufacturing vaccine at, 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 at a much lower cost. Uh, the last one is something that I, I think a little bit more ambitious is that are we able to create artificial organism? You know, I, I, I think they have created artificial DNA before, but not artificial organism that we know exactly how it works. So could we engineer a viral-like organism that just um, that just do what we want and have no other functions? So they have highly efficient production machine or the other way around, can we produce humans or us in the, real, in the, in the computing world where we are able to, since we, are, we are now have the seed of how genetic sequence will go into mRNA sequence and mRNA go into proteins, are we able to simulate everything out in the computers and have another organism that live in a virtual world just completely by itself and by design? I think that will be something that I'm very excited about. And I'm, I'm very excited about their papers and actually hopefully they release their, their source code soon and can have a go. I don't think that's possible to have a lot of TPUs in Google. So for now, that's, that's all I want to say. I hope that you, you enjoy the series and We'll see you in the next one. Bye.